This uh, project is all about increasing awareness and confidence in re renewable natural gas and hydrogen. Uh, CJ is the lead. Uh, Quest has been provided some providing some communication support, and uh, I'm the project manager on this file. Uh, thanks to everybody who has provided input and uh, has participated in uh, these uh, the, the sessions. Um, and thank you to the Government of Canada via the Clean Fuels Fund. Next slide, please. Our target audience here is industry, and um, that's kind of a broad uh, industry, as well as uh, you know other natural gas users, commercial institutional facilities, and um, and municipalities and fleets. And municipalities, municipalities and fleets were very much the focus of uh, the last three webinars that we held. We're also um, developing a number of materials, uh, animated videos, et cetera, that we will uh, make available after um, as part of our outreach to uh, the general population. Next slide, please. So a few strategic considerations here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these, but I just wanted to mention that this was a national initiative that we've been running for over a year. And we've tried to tailor the topics to the, um, the different geographic regions and uh, and sectors that we're speaking to. So um, that's been kind of a key part of, of what we've done. The conversation uh, in, in Nova Scotia looks very different than the conversation in British Columbia and, uh, and elsewhere across uh, Canada. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in terms of the deliverables, I mentioned some of the uh, materials that we're, um, we're creating and we're finalizing right now. So some fact sheets, animated videos, some infographics. We've hosted a number of in-person workshops um, that were very well attended, very good engagement. And um, these, uh, again, this is uh, the, the last in our series of industry-focused webinars. Um, and uh, we will be making a, uh, the recording of this available after the webinar so that you can share it with any colleagues or other interested parties. Uh, and uh, we will make the slides available. Um, the, 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 the project will conclude with a, a report summarizing our findings and making recommendations to government and industry. Next slide, please. Kate, please uh, advance the slide. Thank you. Yes, perfect. So I mentioned uh, that we uh, did have some other, uh, held some other webinars on renewable natural gas and hydrogen. Uh, so this is uh, the uh, the fourth in our series. Um, you, you will be able to go back and look at all of uh, the recordings or the slides. Um, so all of those will be made available um, following our uh, webinar today. Next slide, please. Um, I think that uh, really uh, concludes everything that I wanted to say. Um, we've got a few polling questions, and this really is important to get um, uh, input from all of you in terms of um, what uh, you know, what 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 level of kind of understanding and confidence you have in renewable natural gas and hydrogen. So, um, Kate, if, if you could launch the polls, um, and then we could um, uh, get people to please please respond. It's hard for me to tell, Kate, if the polling questions are up or not. Hopefully they are and everyone can see those and is able to respond. Um, what I will say is um, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the thumbs up there. Um, I'm having uh, terrible teams technical challenges, so uh, something's very wrong, um, but I, I am trying to deal with it. Um, so we are looking for input. If any of you have any other uh, uh, input, feedback in terms of challenges or actions, messaging that can help build confidence in renewable natural gas and hydrogen, um, please use the chat, use the Q&A, or you can always send uh, myself, um, or Kevin or the organizers a uh, an email. Uh, we're happy to meet with you and chat 
uh, to relay any, any feedback you have. Um, can you please advance to the next slide, Kate? And uh, yeah, and then we are uh, very keen to continue working with you. And uh, so if, if you see an opportunity to uh, expand the work that we're doing with more webinars or um, other workshops, events, um, or, or topics that, that need further uh, investigation, please do reach out. Uh, we'd love to uh, hear from you. Okay, so that's it for me. If you could just go to the next slide, just so that they have um, my contact info and uh, and Kevin's contact info. Perfect, thank you. Um, that's great. Um, thank you for uh, listening to me and cooperating and responding to the polling questions, um, especially for those of you who have uh, heard me say this uh, now, I think maybe for the fourth time. So um, the pain is over now and I will pass it on to Rye Smith i um, very, very excited to uh, hear this presentation uh, when we approached Rai um, uh, and, uh, and Gupar with Change Energy. Um, they had mentioned that they had some novel uh, technology applications for hydrogen in, in mobile, uh, offering mobile power, uh, serving remote and industrial power needs with hydrogen. And uh, so I'm very, very excited to hear this presentation. And um, I'll catch up with everybody after uh, when um, to go through any Q and A questions uh, for the presenters. So with that, Rai, um, floor is yours. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Um, and hello, everyone. Thanks for attending this session. As Richard said, uh, today's uh, presentation is going to be about hydrogen in mobile power applications, and that's. Um, you know, a lot of the talk about hydrogen has been focused on automotive uh, applications as well as uh, large, large industrial applications, uh, what they call hydrogen at scale, so to speak. But we have been um, working in this uh, area for many years, uh, about 30 years now in, in high pressure gaseous fuels, uh, about 20 odd in, in involved in hydrogen. And we've really spent a lot of time looking at different applications that will help to get the market rolling, help develop the infrastructure, help seed the uh, seed the uh, the uh, public discourse, uh, early commercialization and development of infrastructure uh, for the introduction of hydrogen as uh, as an alternative fuel. Um, Hydrogen is not our only game. We look at all alternative fuels uh, equally. We're looking for the best alternative fuel uh, for a, uh, a, a given end user. We just have found that um, in many mobile power applications, hydrogen uh, serves very well. Yep, sorry, Gupar, you were right there. Good, thanks. Gupar's in control of the slides here, so I'm at her mercy. Uh, so, um, just by way of introduction, um, I'm a specialist in the design, modeling, and analysis of gaseous fuel infrastructure stations and systems, um, not only in the design of facilities, but also in their technical, economic, and environmental uh, attributes uh, in the assessment of their uh, attributes. Uh, did we lose the slides? I don't see them on the screen. Are the slides still visible to everyone? Pardon? No. I can bring them on. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry, we just had a technical issue. Um, I'm just going to have to share my screen here, just a sec. Okay. Okay. Do people see the? Uh, hmm. I'm sorry. Uh, Gupar's computer crashed. I just said she was in charge of the slides, but she's had a, a system interruption, and I need to find out if I'm online here now. Yeah. 
you're online, Rye. We can definitely hear you. But uh, but I'm not but displaying. I'm not displaying. You're not displaying. Okay. Okay. Sorry about, Sorry this. about this. All good. There you go. That looks good. Okay. 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 Great. Great. I just have to figure out how to control this. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't see what slide we're on. Do this. Can you take, okay, it, back can you take it back to the part? Yes, I can. Yes, I can. Okay. Okay, very good. Very good. Okay. Okay. So yeah, as I was saying then, um, we've I've been in the business of alternative fuels for over 35 years. Um, and uh, we'll go into a little bit more that a little bit more later. But uh, in addition to station design and, and uh, assessment, we're very involved in the development of codes and standards. I'm the chair of the CSA Transportation Strategic Steering Committee. Uh, and I'm also the chair of the technical subcommittee responsible for the CSA B108, which is Canada's national standard for natural gas uh, refueling station installation. Um, I'm also uh, currently the chair of the Ontario Hydrogen Association, which is the uh, Ontario affiliate of the newly rebranded Canadian Hydrogen Association, formerly the Canadian Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. So, Kapar? Oh, you're muted. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Kapar Punya. I am the engineering design and market analyst at Change Energy. Uh, my focus is mainly on business case assessment, as well as some of the e detailed engineering design and project management. Before I came to Change Energy, I spent a great deal of time in the mining industry and in areas of process improvement and alternative fuels. So today's presentation, uh, we just went through introductions. We'll go over some basic uh, background about hydrogen and for those who have been to the previous presentation we did, you'll see some overlap. And then we'll talk about H2 onset, other mobile power applications, and finally the impacts and conclusions of these technologies. So a little bit about Change Energy. Change Energy Services is an engineering consulting firm focused on the low carbon economy. Our entire 30 year history has been focused on the practical development of alternative fuels as a way to improve people's lives. Our experience is international, including the design and development of well over 175 gases vehicle refueling stations and virtual pipelines. We also conduct analysis and feasibility studies of markets, applications, and technologies. And we take an active role in the development of necessary codes, standards, and regulations required for the commercialization of these emerging fuels and technologies. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, he's on a couple committees and on the chair of some, and I'm also participating on various uh, code standards and regulation committees. We work with our clients to help plan and execute fuel system transitions that will achieve their desired economic and environmental outcomes. We help our clients move from the conceptual to the actionable. You're muted, Rye. We're going to do that back and forth once or twice, I think. <laughs> so we um, we develop complete turnkey systems, uh, and that's the backbone of our success. We Our process begins with the development and assessment of new business models for emerging applications. We then design the required fuel, um, fuel supply system and uh, supply chains. Um, including infrastructure, facility conceptualization, technology development, and engineering. We interpret and apply codes and standards for the safe use of fuel and equipment. We provide training for employees and equipment users. We facilitate the certification of installations by authorities having jurisdiction. We troubleshoot problems, assess performance, and engineer improvements in the field, and that provides feedback loop uh, to use this information and experience to advocate for policy change, update code standards and regulations, and develop new and improved applications. 
Kapar? Yep, uh, so now we're going to get into hydrogen. Hydrogen was formed shortly after the origin of the universe. It is the most abundant element, 91% of all atoms and 73% by mass. Hydrogen is also the highly reactive part of most compounds, making it an ideal energy carrier of, or fuel itself. So here, hydrogen with its atomic number as one is the lightest element in the periodic table. It's highly versatile, energy dense, and emits no carbon when used in fuel cells or an internal combustion engine, making it a clean and efficient energy carrier. It's commonly found bonded to itself, hence why it's written as H2. Furthermore, hydrogen can be produced from a variety of sources, including water, natural gas, biomass, and even renewable electricity through processes like electrolysis, pyrolysis, and steam methane reforming. Hydrogen fuel cells produce zero nitrogen oxides, unlike internal combustion engines, which do produce some NOx. However, there's strategies for reducing NOx emissions from hydrogen internal combustion engines that are easily implemented with further reduction to near zero by the use of catalytic converters. The only emission from hydrogen fuel cells is the water vapor, making them truly clean energy solutions. With no tailpipe greenhouse gas emissions, hydrogen can be a key vector in a truly zero emission energy delivery system. Hydrogen has a high energy content of 120 megajoules per kilogram by mass, making a valuable portable fuel source. However, its energy content by volume is comparatively low, which makes compression and liquefaction necessary for storage and transportation. Nonetheless, its efficiency in fuel cells and even in internal combustion engines mitigates the concerns we have for its volume-based energy content. And now Rye can speak a little bit more to the energy density. Rye, you're muted. I guess I keep thinking COVID's over or something. Anyway, sorry about that, everyone. Um, yeah, so the uh, energy density of hydrogen, as Gupar mentioned, is kind of an interesting thing. The, the chart at the top of this slide uh, shows the energy density in comparison to other fuels. Now, this does not take into account the efficiency of the end use device. So, um, uh, as Gupar mentioned, the uh, improved efficiency through fuel cells or actually the the Improved efficiency of a hydrogen internal combustion engine over a gasoline or diesel internal combustion engine um, actually means that you get a bit more energy, useful energy out of uh, uh, that content. So the negatives are mitigated somewhat. Um, but this chart is kind of neat in that it shows uh, in the uh, vertical scale um, uh, density by weight. So you can see that hydrogen. Uh, it has quite a high density by weight up there in the upper left hand uh, corner. But conversely, using the X axis there, that shows basically density by volume. And you can see it's extremely low um, in terms of density by volume. Now, that's why we have to uh, compress it. Um, by compressing it to 700 bar, we can get up to about a third of the volumetric uh energy density as compared to diesel uh liquefied hydrogen slightly better than that um and uh but but yes you you do need more volume to store the same amount of hydrogen on board a vehicle or in a tube trailer or or a physical storage system of of, of whatever sort you're using the thing is um you know <laughs> the easiest way to store more energy is to put on a slightly bigger fuel tank, frankly. Uh, a, a fundamental redesign of, of vehicles would easily um, handle that. And in the fullness of time, that's probably the direction we'll go. Uh, because quite frankly, very high pressure hydrogen or even liquefied hydrogen just adds a lot of expense uh, and other operational issues. Um, we've undergone serious changes in the look and appearance of our transportation uh, devices in the past. Um, Horse-drawn carriages don't look very much like today's cars, and that has a lot to do with the arrangement of the passengers, the payload, and the fuel, and uh, and 
uh, prime mover. So as things uh, progress, we'll probably see a shift um, away from what we think of as the typical shape of a vehicle today to a shape of a vehicle that's more optimized for uh, the, the fuels and energy systems of the future. Um, with regard to hydrogen production, uh, the slower uh, graphic is a very high level uh, simplified depiction of the um, so-called color spectrum of hydrogen. There are many different ways to produce hydrogen. Um, and frankly, each passing week seems to bring bring another one along. The informal color coding system for hydrogen, as shown here, which is often referred to as the hydrogen spectrum, uh, while providing a straightforward visual representation of hydrogen production methods, also has some significant drawbacks. In this spectrum, the designation black or gray typically refers to hydrogen derived from fossil fuels like natural gas or coal. Um, this designation signals its relatively high carbon intensity um, and contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Other colors are used to indicate different production methods and feedstocks, um, but it's all rather arbitrary, um, especially when you know we, we talk about green hydrogen, which is presumably hydrogen made via electrolysis using electricity from a zero emission source. Um, and then you get into all these other colors, which are, as I say, rather arbitrary. While this spectrum offers a somewhat convenient shorthand, it really does not address the var variability in carbon intensity for any particular hydrogen production method. Um, you, you can't separate electrons in the grid. Some could be coming from coal, some could be coming from wind. You can't um, really uh, you know, judge the, uh, without a full LCA model, it's difficult to know the carbon intensity of any particular pathway. Uh, moreover, <clears throat> the spectrum simplicity tends to oversimplify the subtle differences between hydrogen production methods within themselves, while at the same time overlooking other uh, more sustainable and substantial pathways. So um, I hope and believe that we will evolve into a hydrogen classification system that is uh, not so arbitrary and uh, r randomly conceived as the spectrum, but uh, move towards something that's uh, uh, more defined, definitive, <laughs> something like a like a food label um, that gives you key pieces of information about the hydrogen that you're using that can be certified and traced. Um, the shortcomings of the hydrogen spectrum underscore the urgent need for a more comprehensive and informative classification system for hydrogen production and utilization. Next slide, Gupar. Thanks. Well, with that as background, I'm now going to get into the topic of today's discussion, hydrogen as a vector for the provision of mobile power. Much of the attention, as I mentioned earlier, that has been paid to hydrogen in recent years has been focused on automotive and large scale industrial applications. Several years ago, we started investigating the potential for hydrogen as a means to provide portable power. And the impetus for this investigation came from the motion picture production industry. And I can go into detail about that. Uh, if anyone's interested, uh, uh, separate from this presentation. With this industry as a starting point, though, the opportunities for mobile power from hydrogen uh, become significant. So as a starting point, we um, at Change Energy have formed uh, uh, the brand and, and uh, uh, actual company uh, referred to as H2 Onset, uh, and the double entendre is very much intended. Uh, H2 Onset uh, provides a low carbon, zero emission solution for the film and television production industry for its portable power generation needs, which are quite substantial. 50% um, of the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the uh, motion picture production industry come from the production of portable power at sets and at base camps. H2 Onset integrates hydrogen production, distribution, and use into a holistic turnkey service. 
hydrogen from local producers is delivered using over the road trailers of unique bespoke design. Um, they're compact and are able to be handled nimbly. And these trailers then uh, transporting the hydrogen connect to mobile power generators located at the sets. Um, those power generators can be easily moved around the set uh, and deployed as required uh, by the day, day's shooting schedule. Safely, they, they are designed uh, with safety topmost in mind um, to provide the hydrogen as needed. Uh, the trailers are designed with uh, convenient drop and swap functionality to allow full trailers to replace depleted units um, on, a, on an uninterrupted basis um, with the empty units uh, circulating back to producers for refilling. The trailers uh, connect to mobile power generators, as I said, on set, safely dispensing hydrogen as needed. A hydrogen powered gen set, um, and the one we're working with is produced by Summers Generator Systems of Stratford, Ontario, and uh, hydrogen onset fuel block then are both delivered to the location. They're connected using uh, standard industry equipment to facilitate a safe flow of hydrogen. The fuel supply is remotely monitored from our operation center, and as the fuel block nears depletion, a new fuel cell, a new fuel block is delivered. Um, this service, as I mentioned before, provides uninterrupted genset operation 24/7. Our focus on um, I'll get into this in a little bit more detail, but I think it's useful to mention at this point in time that one of these fuel blocks or the hydrogen delivery trailer uh, contains sufficient energy to provide all of the production's needs for a full day. That, that was our design point. So the swapping of the uh, hydrogen at site um, can happen during the production's downtime. Usually there are a few hours of downtime and that's when we would swap out the fuel trailer, even though it won't, uh, it will be, it is swappable without inter uh, interruption of the delivery of power. Our focus is on tailored volume applications, um, providing a wide array of business businesses with access to low carbon energy solutions, allowing for more participation in climate action. So why the TV uh, film and TV production as a as a uh, as a starting point for this? Well, there were many reasons why the film and television production industry was attractive uh, for mo the introduction of mobile power. Uh, first of all, the stakeholders in the industry include high profile um, companies and individuals who publicly support climate action. Um, the emissions from the film and television production industry uh, really highlight the bread not circuses uh, theme of a lot of climate uh, um, activism, uh, which impacts on their market, their end use market. Um, another factor was the fact that this market size is big and it's growing. Studios and streamers are in an arms race for consumer, consumer attention. Content creation is growing. The movie industry in Toronto would currently use about the same hydrogen as a fleet of 100 to 150 buses. And this is this the, the movie industry is just the tip of the iceberg for mobile power. The relative cost, um, the rel the cost of delivered energy through this uh, through the hydrogen vector is low relative to the cost of a production, while energy emissions, as mentioned, have a very high profile. That's very important. If you're looking at the total cost of production, um, if you were to um, double or upset the uh, cost of fuel. Um, you would want an industry where the cost of fuel is relatively low compared to the overall cost of operations. In the movie industry, the cost of energy uh, represents typically around um, somewhere between a half and 2% of the total cost. If you were to double that, you achieve zero emission for the, um, for the production 
at next to no um, impact on the overall cost of operations. That's not true with um, uh, most automotive applications um, and fleet applications. And so there's a much greater risk in fleets. So introducing it into this market is um, much more palatable to the uh, end user community. Um, demand response. The so-called chicken versus the egg issue faced by many early hydrogen applications is avoided here because seasonal and day-to-day -day, uh, regional demand can be anticipated according to production schedules and responded to according to actual operations. That means that asset investments can be made in lockstep with the demand in growth. Um, and so from an operational point of view, we can keep up with demand. And from an investment point of view, we don't have a lot of stranded assets. Another thing is it is a marquee industry. Uh, and proven success in a marquee industry will inspire other sectors to take climate action. One thing I didn't really say here was that the amount of infrastructure required for this market is relatively small and yet it's significant and it lays the foundation for development of uh, hydrogen as an energy vector for a wide range of additional applications leading to vehicle fueling and others that use more fuel. And we'll talk about some of those other applications, Kupar. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we'll get into other applications where kind of the base of what we set for H2 onset can apply for mobile fueling options and um, what that will kind of look like in the North American market. So mobile hydrogen energy solutions offer a versatile and sustainable approach to meeting the energy needs across a wide range of applications. So far, we've only talked about uh, film sets as a marquee industry, but other range from transportable options for, um, for other industries, including construction, mining, emergency response. And so these applications allow hydrogen fueling stations for fuel cell electric vehicles as well to the provision of low carbon intensity energy for charging battery electric vehicles and to other mobile power solutions to enable remote industrial operations. The mobility aspect of hydrogen energy really brings flexibility and efficiency to diverse sectors. These solutions promise zero emission mobility, making them vital in reducing air pollution and combating climate change. As depicted on the slide, the wireless grid enables distribution of remote and off-grid energy supplies to applications in places that are off-grid or poorly supported by this grid. Um, and as you can see on the production side, we have non-traditional hydrogen producers available to us as well when you go with this option. So in addition to the motion picture applications, mobile hydrogen technologies can provide reliable energy in remote industrial locations for temporary events or during emergencies. While harnessing the diverse and widespread hydrogen production, the wireless grids hold particular promise and significance in industries in Canada, such as construction, mining, emergency services, as well as servicing remote communities, many of which currently import diesel for all their energy requirements and other industries similar to the film industry where portable power might be necessary. And that's where we have that application section. So diesel fuel is a multitude, uh, services a multitude of applications globally and hydrogen is, can easily step in to replace diesel. With notable consumption in various sectors uh, and surprisingly in the Toronto area alone, diesel consumption for forklifts and portable generators in the construction far surpass utilize what's in the film industry, highlighting the significant demand for diesel and industrial operations as compared to entertainment. Here you can see some of the notable cities highlighted on the map where these applications are expected to take off first. Um, and as you can see where every dot is centered is around a very large population center, such as Toronto, Vancouver, Montreal, LA in New York. And here we are introducing a TAM, SAM, and SOM analysis. 
The TAM is the total addressable market, the SAM is the serviceable addressable market, and the SOM being the serviceable obtainable market, which will unveil, unveil the full scope of market potential, helping stakeholders identify target segments and tailor their strategies for optimal market penetration and growth for reaching their political industry. Um, here, the 100%, 30%, and 5% are all related to the film industry. In Toronto alone, this is expected to be about seven tons of hydrogen per day. And other notable industries, as I mentioned before, include the forklift industry, materials handling, construction, which is about 15 times the amount, as I mentioned, in the film industry, backup and emergency power, outdoor remote events, emergency response, uh, electricity and water, and integrated community energy systems. It's important to consider, uh, given all the wide range of applications, the total energy cost, where hydrogen presents a compelling alternative to diesel or gasoline and offers potential savings and environmental benefits. And here I will uh, introduce the analysis of our mobile hydrogen energy solutions. So for in part of starting H2 onset, we got the opportunity to evaluate the total cost of this solution across different energy sources such as diesel and in comparison to rechargeable batteries and hydrogen. Surprisingly, opting for a hydrogen powered genset or a H2 genset battery hybrid offers a near zero power at only a slight premium when compared to diesel. When capital, delivery, and operating expenditures are considered, this finding underscores the viability and competitiveness of hydrogen as a clean and efficient energy solution for the film industry. So uh, going through this presentation, although we'll be talking about the film industry, this really applies to any industry, uh, like forklifts, material handling, remote communities, as I mentioned before, but most of our initial analysis was done for the film industry. And now I'll leave it to Rai to kind of talk about the head-to-head -head comparison. Thanks, Kapar. Uh, before I do this, though, I, I just want to hark, um, re refer back to the um, Tam Sam Som uh, slide that uh, Kapar had there. Um, this, the part of the intent there is to show that um, in our analysis, we're not looking at this through rose-colored glasses. We're, we're not imagining that the entire uh, addressable market would be um, would convert over to hydrogen. We know a certain amount will run on batteries. A certain amount will use other um, other uh, low carbon fuels uh, such as RNG or synthetic, um, you know, renewable diesels, and some will stay on existing fossil fuels. Uh, that's why our market uh, really comes down to on the order of two to five percent uh, in the analysis that we've been doing. Also, as you may have noticed when this slide was up, there's a, a growth in uh, in the in the uh, various markets that uh, Gupar has alluded to uh, a number of times. And with each layer of that onion, the uh, market grows uh, quite a bit larger. Um, and we have that in the analysis, but I won't go into that in great in detail here at this point either. Uh, Gupar, if you could go back then to the. Uh, yes, thanks. So th this slide um, shows a what we sort of called a head to head cost comparison of providing um, energy to a, a typical movie set. Um, through th three different pathways, the hydrogen internal combustion engine, uh, lithium ion batteries and uh, diesel generators. Um, the typical energy consumption at a at an active set might could be uh, on the order of uh, 1,755 kilowatt hours uh, on a on a daily basis. And uh, what we're looking at then is how the um, how that energy could be provided when when these things are off grid. Surprisingly, at least it was surprising to us, a lot of um, movie sets, uh, even if they are located in industrial areas of cities, um, still have to bring in portable power because 
of the uh, mismatch between the timing of a production, um, it's the, the production schedule and uh, the ability to actually get a drop from the local uh, electrical utility uh, uh, provider. Um, so a lot of the sets activity is run by uh, from mobile uh, power, even if it's in a an area that one would have expected to be fairly well serviced by the grid. Um, if you look at these, then I'm just if you look at these various examples, um, the, the bottom line is, in fact, on the bottom line, uh, we're looking at the um, the hydrogen gen set. And in this case, we're using an internal combustion engine uh, that is uh, has the design of which is it, it, it's currently under con under construction. But the internal combustion engine uh, based gen set provides uh, power at about $1.44 per kilowatt hour. Now that sounds very high, but that's because we have included all costs here. Rental of the gen set, provision of the fuel, deployment of the power um, infrastructure at the set, recovery of all that e equipment from the set at the end of the production, um, and um, other operational costs associated with providing portable power. So that dollar forty four compares way over if you look way over on the right for a diesel gen set, you're looking at about a dollar thirteen per kilowatt hour. So yes, it's more expensive. But as I mentioned earlier, that the delta in that um, does not amount to a huge impact on the overall cost of the production. If you were to try to do that using a battery system alone to provide that amount of energy, um, with batteries alone, you'd be looking at something on the order of $2.69 per kilowatt hour. And that's using commercially available uh, battery, uh, portable battery systems uh, that are in fact being used by the film industry um, today. If you were to hybridize the hydrogen gen set with the batteries so that now you do not have to take the batteries back, keep in mind, we're looking at a low, carbon intensity operation. So in this case, rather than charging the batteries um, uh, from a diesel gen set, um, the deep batteries have to be transported back to a point where they can be recharged. That cost was built in. If you don't have to do that, that's what the, uh, the, the, the third column is all about. And that pr price for uh, sort of a hydrogen gen set battery hybrid system is around $2.14 a kilowatt hour. And if you were to use a hybrid diesel battery system, you're at about $1.06 per kilowatt hour. It all depends on what you're after. Clearly that $1.06 is the lowest cost, but look at the line above it. It's um, You're looking at around uh, 18, almost 1900 kilograms of CO2 emissions in that case. The diesel alone is at about uh, 2300 kilograms of CO2 emissions, whereas the battery uh, system is down at 83 kilograms and the hydrogen system is at around 260 kilograms of CO2 emissions. This is using um, uh, Ontario numbers based on uh, carbon intensities from the uh, GH Genius um, modeling system. So you, you can see that um, the costs are, uh, the, the cost of the hydrogen system is um, more, but not outrageously more. We're not talking about double, we're talking about a cost, uh, a, a premium of between 25 and 30% um, for, for a hydrogen system. And, um, this slide kind of speaks to uh, where we expect that to go and what the uh, relative impact is on a on a movie shoot. So um, the cost of clean hydrogen is expected to decline over time. The demand for renewable uh, and, and the demand for renewable diesel will um, eventually exceed supply and the cost of conventional diesel will rise. 
um, predictions indicate that clean hydrogen will compete on a dollar for dollar basis with renewable diesel sometime within the next five years and with conventional diesel within 10 years. Now, this is partly due to climate uh, change policies, which will contribute um, to creating upward pressure on diesel prices through things like carbon pricing, the clean fuel standard and other policy tools. Um, the total cost to supply, install, strike, fuel and operate two 1500 amp diesel generators over a 12 day shoot in a market with no permit fees is around $54,000. The comparable cost of two of our hydrogen genset units is about $66,000 for a difference of $12,000. So on a $12 million shoot, this represents an increase in the overall production budget of a tenth of a percent. Some markets like Vancouver are posed, poised to erase the diesel price advantage altogether. In Vancouver, green productions now receive a 50% discount on their um, genset permit fees. So in the example above, the fees for a diesel powered shoot would increase by about $24,000, whereas for a signal for a um, uh, a shoot powered with a zero emission gen set, the fees would only increase by $12,000 and that eliminates the uh, cost differential entirely. So hydrogen fuel cell technology offers a solution when large amounts of power and energy are required. Um, certainly if you only require relatively small amounts of power or energy, uh, batteries are just fine and, and they're a relatively easy, straightforward way to achieve that end. Uh, once this point is understood, it becomes apparent that hydrogen fuel cells and batteries ought to be deployed as complementary technologies, a hand-in-hand -hand, um, uh, approach um, rather than a, a competitive head-to-head -head approach. Uh, battery power sources are becoming essential to onset electrification. However, there's an upper limit to their usefulness. The ceiling of um, the uh, use of batteries is something on the order of 60 kilowatts and about 500 kilowatt hours uh, of, of energy provided. Battery technology will significantly benefit from integration with hydrogen powered generators. The only way to make batteries zero emission is, is to have a recharging strategy that is also emission free. So recharging on location with a diesel generator is not a low carbon uh, or sustainable option. In this, uh, if you look at the numbers that we've got here, uh, typically our standard uh, delivery unit uh, that we're working with holds about 189 kilograms of of hydrogen, which can uh, be converted into about 1,600 um, usable kilowatt hours. Whereas the largest battery systems, it, it's not indicated on this slide, but the largest battery systems are uh, on the order of five to 600 kilowatt hours, and they're really heavy and awkward to work with. Um, also, our basic unit is about the same size as a standard diesel gen set, and we're putting out around 180 kilowatts, whereas um, usually battery systems peak out at somewhere uh, between 20 and 50 uh, kilowatts. Those are very general numbers. Um, on case-by-case -case basis, they, that, that'll, that'll change. Okay, Upar. Thanks, Rai. And now I'll talk about some of the other impacts of switching to hydrogen mobile power solutions. So on a very high level, there's three parts that are impacted people, planet and your profits. So the impacts of switching to a clean mobile power solution can be significant for these three items. From our analysis, significant and sustainable financial, environmental, and social and governance impacts can be seen over the next decade, focusing on the Toronto and Vancouver markets alone, these substantial outcomes are predicted. 
clean hydrogen usage will reach about 20,000 tons per year in the North American film industry, and this results in a reduction of over 370,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalents. This means a displacement of over 100 million liters of diesel, and with current fuel prices, this can be very lucrative. These impacts underscore the transformative potential of clean hydrogen adoption and fostering both economic growth and environmental stewardship. And this is just for the film industry. The additional industries increase this by a factor about 20. As I mentioned before, the construction industry in Toronto alone is about seven times the size or 15 times the size of the film industry. Right over to you. Thanks, Kapar. This slide really just provides a little bit more detail um, uh, to what was being discussed on the last slide. Uh, within the next 10 years, we, ex uh, we would expect to see um, mobile power uh, being used in the motion picture uh, industry in several North American markets. In this slide, we're looking at the growth um, over uh, a 10-year period in Toronto, Vancouver, New York, Chicago, Atlanta, and Austin, uh, Texas, some of the major film uh, industry uh, locations uh, in Canada and the U.S. Um, we, uh, this, this particular slide leaves the, uh, leaves the Los Angeles market out. Um, there are reasons for that, but the Los Angeles market um, uh, essentially would double this uh, on, on its own. Um, in this 10-year period, by the end of this 10-year period for the markets I mentioned, we would expect just for the movie industry alone to see about 500 fuel cell generators in operation um, with the capacity to provide about 90 megawatts of clean hydrogen power in the field. Um, we would be looking at about 1.5 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions reduced over that 10-year period. Uh, we would expect to see about 7,000 direct job jobs created, and this would all be happening under a profitable uh, operation. Uh, in other words, not heavily subsidized. Um, we would expect some assistance to get over that initial hump to get the thing going. Um, but the whole point of this is to operate a market for a hydrogen end use application that does not require any um, additional government subsidy. Par? Thanks, Rai. And finally, I'm just going to do a very simple head to head comparison of generating energy by both hydrogen and diesel. And here, very high level are the numbers that we were showing earlier, but those are a bit crowded with all the different kinds of comparisons that we have available. Um, and so this is the impact of generating about 2000 kilowatt hours. And for reference, if anybody doesn't know how much energy that represents, roughly a thousand square foot house consumes anywhere from 15 to 25 kilowatt hours per day. Um, and this is a large generator. So this is almost a hundred times that amount. So in hydrogen, we have the potential of zero emissions uh, with some upstream emissions from the production distribution side, and it comes around to a dollar and 44 cents per kilowatt hour. And then on the diesel side, we have over 2000 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions, and the cost comes to a dollar and 13 cents cents per kilowatt hour. And so in reality, it's only a difference of about 30 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, which makes this much more appealing to some markets versus others. And I don't think these numbers have been updated with the current diesel prices. Uh, Rye, let me know if I'm wrong. Um, no, you're, you're right there. Yeah, so this 30 cent gap is much more narrow today than it was a year ago. Okay, and just uh, by way of closing, we've focused a lot on the um, motion picture industry because that's really where we got this going. And we've been doing a lot of our 
um, system design and uh, market analysis and research around the motion picture industry. Um, but there are other markets that this will apply to, especially as we get the uh, infrastructure out, as we get the infrastructure uh, up and running and developed, costs will come down and that will open the door to other industries, other adjacent industries. So we look at um, providing hydrogen to smaller forklift operations. To be sure, there are a lot of hydrogen powered forklift operations, but they tend to be larger um, in order to make the numbers work. With this uh, delivery system, we can fuel uh, forklifts and other smaller scale industrial applications. The construction industry is heavily reliant on portable power. And um, a, a lot of uh, um, people in the construction industry currently use battery powered tools. Those batteries need to be recharged. Those batteries are not zero emission if they're being f uh, fueled by a dirty grid or by a um, diesel powered genset. So it's a, a great way to work hand in hand with batteries and for reducing emissions at, in the construction industry. Uh, backup power facilities, making sure that uh, um, all kinds of uh, buildings, small industry, institution building, institutional buildings um, have adequate uh, backup power are, and are fed by um, uh, a reliable stream of hydrogen fuel um, can be easily accommodated through this type of infrastructure and system. Outdoor and remote events are another uh, key industry. Emergency response is, is very uh, important too. Uh, being able to deploy, um, in fact, um, a, a lot, you know, a lot of the use of the GenSet fleet across North America is deployed when emergencies occur, such as the uh, flooding that followed uh, Hurricane Katrina and and other events of that type. Um, not only is electricity badly needed, but clean water is needed, and systems can be developed to capture the water from um, from a fuel cell uh, and and use it as as clean drinking water with with very little um, additional treatment of the water from that source. Um, something we call ISIS or integrated community energy systems for remote communities. Um, currently, a lot of remote communities in Canada are uh, fueled with diesel and having a system for uh, delivering the right amount of hydrogen to the right kind of hydrogen um, equipment, um, having those systems in place would enable integrated community energy systems of, of the future. So that those are some of the uh, other emerging markets that we see for uh, hydrogen mobile power. Uh, it does represent a rather significant um, market for hydrogen and for hydrogen technologies. And um, we're excited about being part of the uh, development and growth of this market. And with that, thank you for your time listening to Gupar and I today. Oh, you're muted, Richard. I was double muted. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so uh, appreciate that, Ryan Gupar. That was uh, that was really interesting. Thank you very very much for uh, your remarks and um, uh, very very interesting to to hear. Um, and you know, I live in Toronto, and so we see our fair share of um, of film sets. And uh, yeah, you you can hear their kind of diesel. Uh, you can hear the diesel kind of engines running. So um, this is really really fascinating. Um, we do have a few questions if, if you have time to uh, to answer here. Um, so the first one is, uh, what the what would be the typical capacity of a hydrogen trailer? I know that might be uh, kind of typical, quote unquote, but uh, I don't know. Can you give us some ranges there? Uh, sure. Um, the the kind that you see uh, trundling down the highway uh, now, if you if you see like a, a, a 
uh, a merchant gas uh, tube trailer, um, they can be up to about a ton of, of hydrogen, uh, you know, a thousand kilograms of hydrogen. Um, we're not looking at that size of uh, tube trailer. We're looking at things that are substantially smaller so that to Richard's point, you could uh, operate a system of this type um, on a residential street, um, get it into uh, close quarters where a, a, move, a, a construction might be going on, uh, where emergency relief is, is necessary. Um, so we've been targeting um, a, a on the order of 150 to 200 kilograms of, of hydrogen. Um, that means we can mount the hydrogen on a tube, on, on a trailer that's about the same size as the trailer that's carrying around the genset. And those are about the same size as a diesel genset. So we're, um, we're, we're trying to uh, minimize to max, minimize size and weight to maximize um, uh, the, the nimbleness. Our first, our very first tube trailers um, that we uh, purchased and are about to put on the road within the next um, month or two, um, they have a total capacity of uh, 150 kilograms and um, 150 kilograms at um, about 250 bar. Um, and uh, those, when I say 150 kilograms, we consider only about 135 kilograms of that usable. We, we need to leave a certain amount of hydrogen on board the tube trailer um, to, um, uh, to, to provide, you, you, you don't want to draw the tube trailer down to zero. And in some cases, the, uh, the uh, cylinders themselves don't like to be cycled down to zero. Um, so we, we leave about 10% of the hydrogen on board. Um, we are expecting a second generation of tube trailers relatively soon that will be uh, able to be filled up to uh, a little bit in excess of 400 bar. And, uh, and of course, that means we can store more hydrogen in the same volume. And as I mentioned earlier, that translates into about uh, 1900 to 2300 kilowatt hours when when the hydrogen is used in the um, in in the uh, in the genset, whether it's a an ICE or a a fuel cell based genset. Okay, great, uh, great response. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ray. Um, okay, so then there's another question, which the question is kind of mixing a couple of concepts, but maybe you could uh, kind of, maybe we can address them one by one. Um, so there's a question around safety, but also kind of efficiency of material uh, for hydrogen storage tank design. So can you speak to like, what, what are these tanks typically made of, if you know? Sure, yeah. Um, the Hydrogen storage tanks are very similar to CNG storage tanks. Uh, they come in the type one, two, three, four, uh, where one is uh, uh, is just a, a straight metal cylinder. Um, then you get into a, a metal cylinder with a with a fiber overwrap. Uh, then you get into a metal cylinder with a complete, um, uh, basically a metal liner uh, with within a a complete envelope of composite material, and then you get into uh, cylinders that are um, completely um, uh, composite materials, typically with a, 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 a some kind of plastic uh, liner with a with a carbon fiber overwrap. Um, right now, this first uh, th these first um, trailers that we're getting are of the uh, of the type three with a metal liner and a carbon fiber overwrap. Um, the, of, of course, uh, the further up that scale you go from type one to type four, the lighter the cylinder becomes. And so that that's obviously something we're going for is uh, lightweight um, on these, uh, lightweight for the uh, hydrogen storage. Um, 
I'm not sure. I, is the safety uh, yeah. these? Yeah, from a safety perspective, uh, these cylinders are designed um, under essentially the same codes and standards as uh, natural gas uh, vehicle uh, cylinders, um, and they are uh, put through the same kinds of tests. Um, they are uh, it, when they're being used for over the road. Uh, transportation, sorry, over the road hauling of hydrogen. They have to be approved by Transport Canada. Um, and uh, there are CSA and and uh, and uh, NFPA codes that uh, that are that that dictate what kinds of cylinders can be used in what uh, types of applications. Um, so we have national codes. Uh, that call out the standards for the uh, various pieces of equipment. And then, of course, those codes are um, enforced uh, by the legislation of, of the of the various jurisdictions. Um, so there's a there's legislation in, in place that says that, you know, you, you must use um, uh, cylinders uh, designed um, in accordance with these codes and and standards, um, you know, in, in as an engineer, it's it's difficult to make absolute statements. But generally speaking, um, the storage systems for natural gas and hydrogen uh, on on vehicle systems and and in their containment systems at refueling stations uh, and the uh, containment systems for over the road transport are uh, really safe. They are probably the last. Um, in fact, the uh, one of the last things you need one needs to worry about. In, in this case, we're talking about transporting the hydrogen as a gas, um, not as a liquid. So we're not talking about uh, a, a, a boiling liquid evaporating vapor, you know, blevy type um, explosion. Um, if there is a, a serious accident with a with a fire. Uh, furthermore, um, the, the properties of hydrogen are such that uh, when you release the hydrogen, um, it tends to leave the site very quickly and uh, um, it, it, it tends to vent down from the cylinders themselves very quickly and then it leaves the local environment uh, very quickly because hydrogen is extremely buoyant and has a very high uh, coefficient of dispersion. So, um, yeah, I could go on, but I, I, I might I know, be uh, over, over overstressing the point. The point. <laughs> no, no, no. I think I think the point's well made, and I think um, one of the things that we learned through you know a lot of the workshops and discussions that we've had is there's this idea that um, you know hydrogen is 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 new, right? And um, you know, hydrogen has been used for a long time and it's regularly uh, kind of moved around and traded and stored and, and used in various uh, applications. It's just that now we're talking about kind of novel applications. So, you know, it's like people have to kind of get used to seeing hydrogen as kind of a replacement um, for uh, for some of these fuels that, you know, we're, we're, we're comfortable with. But um but no, uh, great, great answers there. Uh, well, right. yeah, I'd, I'd like to just yeah, add, add to add, add to that point. Um, you, you're absolutely right. It's it's where a fuel is new that uh, that you run into problems. It, it's not that the fuel itself is inherently dangerous. Any fuel has to be able to burn or explode, or it's really not much use as a fuel. <laughs> you know, that's if it if it can't burn or or, or uh, be detonated. Um, you you don't have a fuel. Um, you have to have some way of releasing energy, and this is true with batteries too. That's why we see battery systems catching fire, and that's why there are you know safety systems around batteries, and there are safety systems around diesel, and safety systems around natural gas, gasoline. Um, uh, you know you, you even have problems with uh, silos. Um, you know uh, silos can uh, have serious yeah. fires. Um, and as far as familiarity goes, I've been in natural gas and hydrogen for a very long time. My first, uh, as my kids were growing up, the first vehicle they were exposed to uh, was a natural gas vehicle. Um, 
my kids uh, grew up with the concept of filling natural gas vehicles. Uh, there's a, a, a I, I won't go on very long and bore everyone, but there's a story in my family where the first time one of my kids filled a vehicle with gasoline, they spilled gasoline on their shoes and ruined them. And they could not believe what a stupid, dangerous, ridiculous fuel gasoline was. That speaks to familiarity. They were familiar with one fuel and not the other. So, so. Right, right. Okay, I like that. Um, you've got a couple more questions here. Uh, first one is, can you give us a, um, like a, is there like a conversion factor, um, or, you know, like an equivalence in terms of, um, you know, if you needed a certain number of liters of diesel, um, how much hydrogen would you need to uh, serve the same load? Okay, that's that's, that's a really, that's good, a really question. good question. Quick answer. Um, the energy content of uh, hydrogen and the energy content of diesel, um, a gallon of diesel and a kilogram of hydrogen have almost the exact same amount of energy, they, chemical energy. They, they contain about the exact same amount of chemical energy. So, um, it, it, so very roughly speaking, you know, you're, you're looking at around uh, um, four li one kilogram of hydrogen has about the same chemical energy as four liters of, of gasoline. And, that, and that's also pretty close um you know plus minus five or ten percent to you know gasoline um the the other thing to be considered though is how that energy is converted from its chemical form stored in a cylinder to um m motion of wheels on a car or electrons coming out of the back of a generator um usually a fuel cell um system is um operates at between 40 and 50 percent efficiency um including uh, balance of plant that might drop into the high 30s to mid 40s um whereas a diesel system you're looking at um uh something on the order of 30 to uh, maybe as high as 33 percent um, when you take the balance of plant into account. So you're, you're, even though the amount of energy stored is might be the same, the amount of energy you can get out of it is slightly better. So when we do our analyses, we take those uh, differences in um, energy conversion uh, into account as well. That's great. Um, thanks for that. And yeah, no, I, I certainly the application uh, and and the uh, you know you got to you got to pair up the fuel with the technology to to get the overall. Uh, um, um, okay, so uh, last question here, unless we get any uh, kind of last minute ones here, is um, regarding your dollar forty four per kilowatt hour. Um, can you can you can you kind of dive deeper into um, what the cost of the hydrogen supply was to come up with that dollar forty four per kilowatt hour figure? Um, sure. The I all, all the all the details I could get into uh, uh, in in a in a more complete discussion, but the input value of the hydrogen there was around fifteen or sixteen dollars a kilowatt. Uh, sorry, a kilogram. Um, which might sound to be uh, on the low side. It's a, it's a, about what hydrogen was being sold for um, at uh, California um, vehicle refueling stations uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and it, it, of course, has gone up quite a bit. The reason, though, that we're confident, um, there's been a full analysis of everything from the pencils being used by the accountants in the back shop to the cell phones used by the drivers uh, operating the delivery vehicles. Um, we've you know, included all of the costs of a delivery service um, and then looked at you know, what, what would we have to set the price at to uh, recover those costs with a, a reasonable operating margin. Um, we're taking the gas not to a high priced vehicle refueling station, but we're picking the gas up. We're only compressing it to 250 to 400 bar into a tube trailer. Typically, we don't drive that tube trailer more than about um, 75 kilometers at most. 
Um, so we are looking at local supplies of hydrogen and um, and so and, and then delivering that hydrogen directly into the gen set. So there's not a lot of um, uh, handling of the hydrogen once it's being produced. So and, and we're taking it directly from the producer's spigot. So that $15 per kilogram number uh, is is quite realistic. OK, great. Well, um, that's it for the questions here. Um, and uh, this has been uh, this has been incredible, right? And uh, Gupar, you certainly know your stuff. Um, thank you very much, and I, I wish you um, all the all the best and, and luck with uh, your um, hydrogen on set. Uh, so looking forward to seeing those uh, on the streets of Toronto and elsewhere. Um, and uh, and that's it for our webinar today. Uh, as I mentioned, um, we will make these slides available as well as a recording uh, for anyone interested. And um, please feel free to um, to send those around to anyone who who uh, you think might benefit from uh, seeing them. Uh, thank you, everybody. Please get in touch if there's anything you want to chat about regarding RNG hydrogen, um, and if you want to get involved with this initiative. Thank you very much, and bye bye. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Richard.